Hi there, my name is Trish Lynch from IOHR TV. You're very welcome. Today we've taken NGO Focus on the road from London to Oslo. This beautiful city has one of the highest living standards in the world. It boasts a rich economy, a low unemployment rate, and is one of the best health and welfare systems. But despite all of this, it's still at the very top of the statistics of registered drug overdose deaths in Europe. ACTUS, which is an umbrella organization that represents 33 NGOs that work to reduce the harm caused by alcohol, drugs and gambling. Let's now go to the studio and speak to the head of the International Department, Mr. Stig Erik Surheim. Stig Eric Sarmheim, uh, thank you so much for joining us today on NGO Focus to share with us the incredible work that your organisation is doing. Thank you. Now, Norway, one of the most affluent countries in Europe, but it also has one of the highest rates of drug overdose deaths. Mm. Tell me why that is. I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. Uh, I think some of it has to do with uh, the use patterns that we see in Norway. We have a very high rates of injecting drug use, which is the, uh, the riskiest way of uh, consuming drugs. Um, we also have high levels of, of uh, polydrug use, uh, which furthermore increases the risk of overdose. Um, what is polydrug use, just for our viewers at home? It means that you use more than one drug uh, at the time. Uh, so if you have heroin, uh, you perhaps add alcohol and benzodiazepines, uh, which will increase the risk of dying. So that's uh, a clear risk factor. When we talk about mm. drug overdose, mm. is there a particular age group that's most afflicted? Is it teenagers? Is it older people? What mm. do the statistics tell us? Well, the data shows us that the, the people who die from overdoses are getting older. Uh, the average age of the people who die from overdoses has increased by 0.7 years per year for the past 10 years, which means that it's pretty much the same group of people who are dying, the same cohorts of people who are dying. Uh, and these are people who perhaps started their drug using careers in the late 80s or early 90s when the heroin epidemic hit Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much the same people who are dying now. Now I know that it's not just the people who are in this vicious spiral of mm. drugs that you help, but you also help the extended family. Tell me what mm. kind of support you give to family members. Uh, some of our member organizations work with uh, families uh, that are affected by drugs uh, and alcohol, uh, children, uh, they provide support services, mm -hmm. uh, helplines, uh, um, uh, meetings, uh, activities for, for families affected by drugs. Uh, so uh, that's uh, sort of the, the kind of work that they do. Uh, we also have uh, uh, organizations of former users uh, that provide uh, sort of support, group for, support groups for each other and also are active on the political level, providing information and, and, uh, and uh, input to the political processes that affect drug users. Now I know it's kind of a big mm. question but what is the answer? I mean there's probably not one answer, there's probably tenfold answers mm. is there? Well uh, we've uh, um, expanded uh, access to uh, substitution treatment which did help uh, uh, quite a lot in the first couple of years. Uh, it's stabilized since then. Uh, we have an overdose strategy uh, where we try to focus on the high risk uh, use situations uh, also provide, for instance, naloxone, which is an antidote to, to opioids. Of course, you have to inform uh, the drug users about the risks of their, their use and the, the risks of combining drugs particularly. In 2017, we know that there was 38 overdose deaths. That's 15% of the total. They were suicides. Mm. Tell me what the Norwegian government is doing with the new national drug overdose strategy. It's been around mm. now for two months, mm. so it's still very early days. Yeah. Is it working? It's, this is the second uh, uh, overdose strategy. Uh, to the last question first, is it working? We don't really know. Uh, what, there are some early indications that it might be working. Uh, we had a reduction, we have had a re small reduction uh, in overdoses from 2015 to 2016, and a larger reduction from 2016 to 2017. Um, and the data show that um, the reductions have been in the partner municipalities and those, uh, those uh, communities that have been involved in the, the work. The overdose strategy uh, focuses on uh, several issues. Uh, one of them is naloxone, uh, which is the antidote to opioids, which makes it easier to, to help people that have accidentally taken an overdose. 
uh, but there are also uh, uh, measures uh, targeting very high risk situations. For instance, uh, when people come out of prison, mm -hmm. uh, when people come out of treatment, uh, they have lower tolerance and there's a high risk of, of uh, overdose. So there's uh, some work going on to follow up and make sure that the people stay safe in that, mm -hmm. the crucial perhaps two weeks after release from prison or, or from, from treatment. The focus area is, is uh, uh, to have some sort of structured follow-up after a non-fatal overdose because uh, research has shown that, that uh, there's a very high risk of a new overdose once you've taken an overdose. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So uh, these people are high-risk groups. So both people come out of prison, come out of treatment, uh, and uh, who have recently taken an overdose are very high-risk groups. So yeah. if we can follow up with them, uh, that might be a, a good strategy. Is the infrastructure in place to keep tabs on all these different groups of people? You know, I think Norway is in a relatively good position mm -hmm. to do that because we have quite a well-developed uh, public health system uh, with quite good registries. So, uh, um, but I think that there, uh, there, there's quite a lot of work that still mm -hmm. remains. And I think one of the challenges is for different services to speak to each other. And we're also in a sensitive area where, where uh, uh, various agencies can't necessarily just exchange personal or in, uh, information between, it's between themselves confidential because it's confidential. And, yeah. So, uh, so uh, that, those are challenges. But I think, it's, uh, I think both, both the, I think these areas are, are quite crucial. The government have made the decision, the brave decision, to decriminalise drugs. What effect do you think this will have, if any? Uh, we, we don't really know uh, all that much about the effects. Uh, research from other countries have shown that it hasn't led to a uh, great increase in use uh, among young people. So we're hoping that that will be, be the case in Norway as well. And uh, we're also hoping that uh, this will help to make life a little easier for the most uh, for the heaviest users, mm -hmm. uh, the people with the biggest problems. Uh, because the reason for this reform was really to, to remove stigma and to uh, avoid adding to the burden of the, the heavy users. Tell me what decriminalizing it actually means in theory. It means, it's, it's, I mean, it sounds, you, know, you need to distinguish between decriminalizing and legalizing. Uh, legalizing means making it legal, making mm -hmm. production sales legal. Uh, decriminalizing means that you remove it from the criminal justice system and make it it's still illegal still not allowed you can still get some sort of sanction a ban uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, a ticket or, or uh, uh, some sort of other uh, sanctions uh, but it's no longer a criminal offense so it means it won't go on your permanent record uh, and that's uh, that's uh, we don't want to burden young people and the, the heavy users with with criminal records what happens to people who did have a criminal record before and now it's decriminalised? Does that stay on their record or will that be expunged? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, there is a commission or, or working on the, the drug reform and they will uh, hand in their, their uh, proposal at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know exactly what this will look, at, look like and I don't know if they've addressed uh, that issue. Okay, so we just have to wait and see on that. We'll have to wait and see, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Opiate um, addiction worldwide is on the increase, and mm. if we look at Vancouver in mm. Canada, mm. they have safe injection sites mm. over there. Do you think something like that would benefit um, people who are addicted to drugs here in Norway? We have a, a safe injection site in Oslo, and there, yeah. will, there is one in Bergen as well, the two biggest cities where the, the biggest populations of drug users are, are situated. Um, we haven't, well, uh, the people who work there say that this is a good way of getting in contact with them and that they can use this uh, site to sort of guide them or lead them into treatment or, or more, more permanent solutions. Um, the evaluations haven't shown uh, any effect on overdoses per se, uh, but users say that this is helping to destigmatize and, and normalize their lives a little bit. So, so that's been the effect so far. I suppose in an ideal world, prevention has to be the answer. Mm. What's happening with regard to prevention here in Norway? Well, this is one of the things that we've been interested in in connection with the, with the uh, drug policy reform, uh, because the focus has been most, mostly on the heavy users, and we're sort of interested in seeing, uh, uh, is there a risk that uh, young people will perceive the decriminalization as some sort of okay signal? As a green uh, light. Green yeah. light. Uh, and, uh, so, and, and we've also been very 
uh, concern that the, they need to communicate very clearly that we're not talking about uh, legalizing, that it's still illegal, uh, and that there will be sanctions. Uh, and this is very much in line with the, with the uh, um, mandate that the parliament or the government has given to the, the commission that's, that's uh, developing the, the reform now. You said earlier that sometimes drug abuse goes hand in hand with other forms of addiction, mm. for example, alcohol addiction. Mm -hmm. Tell me what kind of work you're doing with regard to alcohol addiction. Our organisation has a long tradition of, of working in the field of alcohol. Uh, so uh, we support uh, restrictive alcohol policies uh, to reduce uh, consumption and to use, reduce harm. Uh, so that's our primary goal. Uh, our member organisations also provide treatment, uh, support groups, uh, family groups, so a, a wide variety of activities, mm -hmm. and then also, of course, uh, prevention for young people. If I could ask you, finally, just to give some words of wisdom to people that are watching this programme that may be in the grip of alcohol or drug addiction or family members who are worried mm -hmm. about family or friends, mm -hmm. where should they go? What's the first thing they should do? For people who are concerned about their own alcohol or drug use, uh, they shouldn't be afraid, afraid of uh, uh, speaking to their doctors. I think that's the, the first, the first uh, uh, contact with the system. Uh -huh. uh, but there are also, uh, so also support groups uh, that they can talk to if they feel that the, the, they, they don't necessarily feel comfortable you know, getting into the health system. Uh -huh. They don't necessarily feel that they should be in treatment, but maybe they, have, they, can, they can share some experiences with people, other people in, in the same situation. Uh, for family members who are concerned about uh, the alcohol and drug use of their loved ones, uh, there are numerous helplines uh, for parents of young children. Of course, they can speak to uh, the doctors and nurses, school nurses, mm -hmm. um, and start looking at the problem, start examining the problem to see how extensive it is and to, to examine whether they need more help. It's, it's a tough one really, isn't it? So it's not necessarily just a quick fix, uh, mm -hmm. but at least uh, many people uh, will benefit from seeking help, not trying to solve this on their own. Well, we thank you very much for coming with us um, today and sharing with us the incredible work that you're doing. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having And um, thank you for joining us for another episode of NGO Focus. Please do watch this programme, share it with as many people as you can and do comment on social media. Until next time, from myself, Trish Lynch, goodbye.